Hello guys. So Coffee On is now live. I'm Carmen. We will discover Africa through coffee cupping. Let's welcome Shelly. We will co-host the cupping session together. Hello. So today's Coffee On program is going to be a little bit different. We will take a trip to Africa through coffee. And I hope you guys managed to join us with coffee already. And like, just to let you guys know as well, we host cupping session quarterly to tell the story about the coffee. And cu cupping is also a session that is part of our daily routine where we cups yesterday's batch to ensure QC. And so, yeah, we're so excited to bring cupping in a very casual form to you guys today. And we love to have a conversation with you. Say hello. Um, wherever you are, if you're in Singapore with me, you're in Malaysia or anywhere else around the world, if you're here with us, say hello. We are very happy to be able to bring this session online uh, with you guys today. So yeah, it's going to be pretty fun to talk about coffee, right? Yeah. Shall we get started? Yes. Um, let's see if I have all the setup ready. Okay. So cupping is going to be a very easy activity activity to do at home as well. So the things that you will need, first you need uh -huh. a bowl. And uh, you don't really need to get like a professional coffee cupping bowl. You can just find like three identical cups, like same amount of volume. So inside uh -huh. of now have like 40 ground coffee. So we have two of them. Uh, we have two more rinsing glasses. Got it. Then you need your cupping spoon. Cupping spoon's ready? Yep. Of course, we are going to be using the cupping spoon to taste the coffees later. We will not be drinking directly from our cup. Then um, some more spare spoons later on for some cleaning up. Then the next thing that you will need is the timer. That All right. Some four minutes. So if you don't have a timer, you can just easily use your mobile phone and then you can tune in to the line via your desktop. Then something else is um, your optional speaking cup. So this one is for data and also for cleaning up to do later. Then of course you need your hot water supply. Okay. Yeah. So I guess we are all ready to cut coffee. I hope everyone here is also joining us um, throughout the cupping session. If you are joining us through the process, if you're going too fast, please let us know. If you have questions and if you want us to spend more time on any particular coffee, we would love to um, also talk about it a little bit more. Yeah, it's, it's very interactive. Yeah, I'm very excited. High five to start. All right. So let's okay. run. Three coffees that we have that we have on our table today. So from left to right, on the left we have the Kenyan coffee called Mutitu. Okay. Yep. Oh, actually, let me show you the back. I know it's a little bit is inverted, but yeah. Yeah. Then the next coffee that we have is a Ethiopian wash Uraga to me. But uh, before we start in a little bit more about what cupping is, uh, we're going to run into step one of cupping. So step one, usually we will actually smell the dry fragrance of the freshly ground coffee. So what we do, we just pick up the cup, give it a light tap and just take a bit. Then just going to do the same for the rest of the coffee. Mm. I think like, so even though they're all from Africa, but they all smell very different from each other. I, I just can't wait to taste them later. It's going to be interesting. So, so like sometimes the dry fragrance actually will give you a hint of how the coffee might taste. So for mm -hmm. example, dairy, mm -hmm. getting like dried cranberries kind of aroma to it. Very pleasant. Mm -hmm. Then the uraga and getting like this of ink like, yeah right like yeah lots of like very floral kind of ginger aroma on it mm. it's impressive 
Oh my god, the I mean the tabe bagai thing like on the Roma is is like a fruit bomb. Like it's just so tropical, so lively and so bright. I mean all of them are equally interesting and let's find out we're going to cup and we're going to talk about the coffee right to understand yeah. how does it why does it taste like you know how it is. So let's right. get Let's get started. Water ready and my timer. Okay. So timer is at 4 minutes and let's go. Let's go. So you realize that when we pour the water, we actually are pouring it pretty vigorously. Uh, purpose is to make sure that all the coffee grounds in the cup, they are all fully soaked and saturated with the hot water, because they've been brewing in a cupping bowl for about four minutes. So remember to make sure you brew it all the way to the brim, and also fill up your in sink hot water as well. All right. How's my setup? Is my setup okay? Let's see. Not bad. You have a very nice muffin dough. Yeah. <laughs> the craft pottery is it looks amazing, and I think like so cupping is a very unique process because not only it's like a like a protocol that is used to. Like buy or decide coffee. Cupping is also like in in a way, you can understand you can understand or you can taste the coffee like fruit to fruit, coffee to coffee because there is no like variable that you can change. So the temperature of the water that's used for cupping is actually ninety four degrees Celsius. Yeah. Right. So now it's more of like waiting for the coffee to brew in the cup for about four minutes, and then in the meanwhile, we're gonna briefly introduce about what how PPP coffee we actually feature and rotate our coffees. So I thought you were gonna dance for us. Sorry, I thought you were gonna dance for us. Dance. <laughs> okay, so for PPP coffee, how we take the coffees is that we have about three. We have three seasons a year, and mm -hmm. then season one we have done. Mm -hmm. Coffees. So last mm -hmm. the one we have the coffees from Guatemala and mm -hmm. also Panama. So right now diving into season two will be the African coffees. So African coffees tend to be quite popular, quite a popular option among coffee drinkers because of their very unique taste profile. So they always have this uh, very distinctive, crisp, juicy acidity, especially coming from the Kenyan coffee. Then. The Ethiopians, they always have this very nice floral, mm. very kind of soft tropical flavor to it. Yeah. So like, I really like to use Ethiopian coffees to uh, introduce non-specialty coffee drinkers into the specialty coffee world because of their taste profile. Um, mm. Because everyone has this image, there's this image attached to coffee that is going to be very bitter, going to be right. very need to add lots of milk and sugar into it. Yeah. But then some when they taste a very good Ethiopian wash, their first reaction will be like, Oh, are you sure this is coffee? Did you just feed me tea? And then they'll start to be like, Oh, it tastes very good as it is. So um, one, of my, one of the reasons why I really, really like the African coffees. Mm. To be fair, um, so one of the reasons, or one of the first few coffee that got me started in coffee industry is a wash Ethiopian coffee because like my first expectation that you know the coffee tasted it's like so bright so fruity and definitely not what I imagine like not imagine like coffee can taste and that just blew my mind and I just you know wanted to learn more so like a wash Ethiopian coffee is a very good introduction like to to um specialty like drinkers as well that's so clean and it's so fruity and yeah, I mean, it's just something that is also very unique, but you can drink it every day. Right. Okay. So we have just hit the four minutes mark. We're going to move on to the next step of cupping, which is called breaking the crust. So you see on the surface of our cupping bowls, there's a very dark coffee grounds layer. So mm -hmm. what we is that we're going to just gently push it because uh, we need to stop the entire brewing process and let the coffee grounds sink to the bottom of the cup, mm -hmm. then 
high, the moment you break the crust, you also get a very strong whiff of how the aroma of the coffee would be like. So what we're going to do is that we're going to take your cupping spoon, we're going to rinse it in hot water, let it dry, and we'll it to it, and then just gently push the surface three times to the front, then three times to the left, and then to the right. Then just give your spoon a good rinse, then try again, and we're going to two other coffees. All right. This season, um, like there's a lot of fruit notes going on, like different different layers and different like types of fruits, like a lot of like tropical fruit here some citrus flavor here, and I love like dry, like mangoes or cranberry over here. I'm getting lots of thought of the Uraga Tome. Really, really excited to start drinking. But okay. before we start tasting, we need to actually clean up our cupping bowls a little bit. So you all can see like the surface like now a little bit like light brown. So those are actually like the oils and some of the mm -hmm. sediment that we need to clear up, that we need to actually clear up. So it's a little bit like, you know, when you go to eat Hai Di Lao, your steamboat session, and then your soup starts boiling. Uh-huh. The server will come out to clean up the oils for you because they don't want you to taste any of that. So it's very similar. Now, now we know you're a regular at Hai Di Lao. Which I haven't been for the past two months. Yeah. So only the surface. Always remember not to dip your entire spoon into your cup of bowl. So we are doing this a little bit quicker so that we can start tasting them. But at home, we are keen on how to do this better, cleaner and faster. You can look up for our blog and our cup of You can clean your, clear the crust like a pro. Yeah. So because we, we do this every morning and we usually cut and taste like 30 different coffees. Mm -hmm. So we all, we sometimes have a competition on like who can clear the crust like the poster so that we can quickly taste the coffee. But yeah, I mean if you're cupping this with us, uh, again say hello. We love to include you in the conversation with us today. Say hello and tell us like what you think. If you want us to slow down, if you think you want, if there's something that's not clear, just uh, let us know. It's very interactive. Okay. So, like, so, so right now everything is cleared up. We kind of reset the entire setting, but there's still a little bit, uh, a little bit longer to go before we can taste the coffees. Because um, coffee is still too hot, and when the coffee is too hot and you start tasting them, uh, it's gonna either burn your tongue or it will just kind of mask the flavors out a little bit. So usually we'll just wait for about another four more minutes for the coffee to cool down and then start tasting them. So the beautiful thing about cupping coffees or drinking coffees in general is that um, the flavors will actually change together with the temperature. So yeah. like maybe what you taste A, but then when it's B, when it's like warm, you're going to taste something a lot sweeter or a lot rounder, a lot smoother. So we're going to slowly taste these coffees bit by bit and we're going to share with everyone how does a coffee taste and we also hope to see some of your comments and feedback if how if uh how the coffee is going to taste on your side as well yeah yeah so like today on the left we have the canyon right just to recap we have the canyon so it's going to be a very good expression of a washed canyon coffee and then in the middle we have got a washed ethiopian called uraga tome and we actually saved the the best of the last in a way. I mean, there's no like direct, like better or worse, but this one will definitely be something that's quite like intense in a sense that it's a natural process Ethiopian. So they're all from the same area, but they all will taste, you know, very different from each other. So we're going to taste everything together. And then we're going to taste the coffee again. And we're going to talk about, about why we like it so much. Right. So four minutes is up. We're going to start tasting them. 
So optional, some people, some of y'all can grab your spin cups if y'all don't want to be too over caffeinated. But mm-hmm. for, we're gonna drink everything, right? Yeah, yeah, we're both gonna drink everything because the coffee is delicious and yeah, we just want to and enjoy it, you know, with you guys today. Yeah. Shall we begin? Yeah, man, let's do that. Wait, so step one, you're gonna pick out your cupping spoon, your very, very important cupping spoon. Rinse it first, then leave it dry. Uh huh. We're gonna just take some from the surface. Remember not to. Oh. Not to I like, got too excited there. Sorry, you say. I spoon on the base of the cupping spoon. Yeah. So just take a little bit on the surface. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Let's go. And now we're gonna taste, right? Three, yeah. two, one. <laughs> so some of y'all might be wondering. <laughs> so, um, slurping is actually part of the ritual of cupping. Why? Because we actually want to kind of introduce, we want to introduce air and we want to spray the coffees across our tongue so that we can taste the coffees better. So, cupping yeah. is actually very, very common, a very common practice during cupping, so we can have some fun to it. Yeah. You also exaggerate the flavor profile. So, if you're at home, if you're with us, cupping today, you can try just like drinking it and you can try a, the same coffee but you slurp it. You can see like, I mean, you won't immediately get like the difference the first time but the more you do it, the better you are able to identify flavours. Mm. Delicious. So remember to read your time. Awesome. Just so that um your coffees don't kind of over contaminate each other. Yep. Yep. How's the coffee tasting? I think like they're all tasting really good. The Kenyan especially like I think it's it's pretty juicy and lots of dry fruits. And I also think that like we can definitely taste better. Um when it's closer to our body temperature. So as you mentioned, the flavors will change as we go, right? So try to take some mental notes or you can also write down notes on what you think. Our main subscription box of uh, subscribers, inside your cupping kit, you actually have this little evaluation card. Then you can actually take it now and up now and then you can write something down to follow how Flavors are changing across with temperature. Yeah. So we're gonna let the coffee cool, and then we're gonna talk a little bit more about who and what these coffees are, so that we find, so that we know what a little bit more about them. Yeah. So the first coffee that we have is the Kenyan Neri Mutitu. So this coffee is actually named after the red mill called Mutitu in Neri. And it's actually supplied by 750 small holder farmers. And it's actually also one of the oldest mills in Kenya. They are actually established since 1957. Hmm. It's pretty interesting. Um, one thing that I also think like that stood out in Kenyan coffee is, oh, is like that kind of profile. Dry fruit, juicy, it's sparkling, it's almost quite lively, right? So it's actually contributed by this varietal. So if you buy a bag of Kenyan, chances are if you pay attention to the royal section, I understand it's inverted, I'm so sorry, but you will see something called the SL28 and SL34. So those two are the type of varietal that was actually sort of founded and sorted by a company called Scott Lab. So they were hired by the Kenyan government to try to find the best strain that is both like high quality and also pest resistant at the same time, good you. So I'm so happy that, you know, those two strains were founded and it tastes so amazing. So it's one of the most well-regarded royal in like Africa, if not like Kenya. So pay attention next time when you pick up a bag of any coffee, Kenyan especially if you can, and yeah, you, you will notice something a little different each time. But yeah, that's what I like about it. So the next thing that is pretty unique to Kenyan coffees is that it has its own um, grading system. 
So coffee is actually one of Kenya's biggest and more important export products. But uh-huh. I guess to QC and to make sure that every single product that is being sent out is good, they implemented uh-huh. terms. So it's based on different factors. Uh, the first one is density of the coffee. Second thing is actually the screen size of the coffee bean. So um, the general assumption is that the bigger the size of the coffee, the higher in quality they are. So it does matter. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, AA, so AA is actually the term that is given to the biggest size coffee, and uh, how they relate size to quality is that generally, if your bean is big in size, it means that there's more flavor compounds inside. Yeah, sense. Mm. So this Kenyan nary that we are having, uh, is actually greater AA, which is actually probably why we are getting so much vibrancy and juicy acidity from this. That's true. Shall we taste it again, now that it's cooled down? Yep. Mm. I'm not sure how does our slurp sound um, for all the viewers like who's watching or listening to us. <laughs> it's gonna sound very like, interesting. For this, for this Kenyan when it was hot, uh, I was getting lots of this very hot my tongue. And then now that when it has cooled down a little bit, uh-huh. it just came through a little bit more. Uh-huh. And then the acidity, they kind of gel together very, very well. And then they just uh-huh. kind of um, very, very yeah. well. So I think like in, in my opinion, um, lots of like dry, dry fruits, plums, anything that is like, it reminds me of like a dark, juicy fruit. Mm. Mm. A bit. Mm. I think this is a, an incredibly good like expression of the Wash Canyon coffee. Yeah, it's like a commercial <laughs> for sleeping. <laughs> yeah, so, so share with us your your notes on what you taste with the Canyon coffee if you are joining us on like with this. So like this coffee is amazing, but Shelly is super excited to tell us more about the next two coffee. Yeah. You can already see she's like smiling already. That's just super excited. So yes, so shall the, we? The next two are uh, two Ethiopian coffees. They are actually kept for by the same producer uh, called Tadesi Edima. So both uh-huh. are actually from Uraga in Ethiopia. And um, Tadesi Edima, he is not just a coffee producer. He is uh-huh. also a producer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what he does is that he helped to make the region here to create schools and also more roads um, in his region as well. So making his the life of the people over there a bit better as well. Right. Started with the Tabe washing station first, 12 years ago. Mm-hmm. And then after that, the Tome washing station seven years later. Mm. Nice. I also heard he came from like a coffee family, right? Like of 30 different like brothers and families that are also in the coffee industry. Yep. So he was sort of like born into like owning and running and the, like being a coffee producer. That's right. So, <laughs> so we're going to dive into Uraga Tome first. So Uraga Tome is uh-huh. uh, my personal favorite for season two because of uh, its very good clarity and very, mm-hmm. very depth. Yeah. So Uraga to me, uh, I believe what really gives, what really contributes to its flavor, which is excellent flavor, is uh, its processing method, how meticulous they are. So for example, uh, after they harvest the coffee, before they move on to any other steps, they actually uh, go through hand sorting, mm-hmm. to bags to remove any uh, under right. Uh, unripe or under or overripe coffee cherries so that they make sure that whatever that goes into the whatever that goes out uh, will actually be very sweet and of very good quality coffee cherries yeah so after they sort uh, uh-huh. the be pulp and also be fermented for 36 to 48 hours in order uh-huh. for the down and then after that uh when everything is done they will then dry the coffee beans on raised beds in very thin layer and then the next thing that they do is that they will actually put in the 
the very meticulous efforts to actually rate the coffee beans every hour. So this step is very important in the entire drying process because imagine you are like drying a fruit under the sun and then you only dry one and then the other surface could probably be rotting underneath. Yeah. So and then you need to just kind of flip it around and make sure that everything is evenly dry. Yeah. So I think like the way that they handle the coffee was actually very meticulous. And uh-huh. so this contributes to as to why the Uraga Tome Wash is one of Uraga's highest scoring coffee last year. Huh? Nice. So and for PP or Pulp follower, last year you probably noticed Uraga Tome on our program as well, right? It's a natural process of the, the I mean the coffee, it, but it's a natural process version. So today we, we really love the wash process one and we decided to feature it. Yep. Should we taste it? Yeah. Mm. Awesome. I think the mouthfeel, um, it became really very silky. And then like the whole bergamot and the, the kind of taste grew even more, and more, more intense when it cools down to warm. A lot easier to drink now, very, very comfortable. Mm. Yeah, very clean, but at the same time, like it's bright, it's citrusy, it's a little bit floral, like pink ginger kind of notes, and it ends with a slight like sort of like tea-like kind of character. Yeah. I think it's probably also one of my favorite like expression of wash Ethiopian this year. Very nice. Mm. It's delicious. So, I guess it's my time to talk about the Tadi Burka. So uh, th- this coffee is, I think it's, we always try to save like the more intense one for later. And we try to taste like in terms of in- intensity, which is why we have the Kenyan, the wash, and then the natural for the last, mainly because this is a little bit like a fruit bomb. So this delicious coffee comes from the labor intensive natural drying process that helps to ensure quality. And Shili will explain to you why and how this coffee can still be so vibrant, like a fruit bomb, but at the same time so clean and tastes great, you know. Yep. So after they harvest the cherries, uh, the cherries will then be put in a very big tank filled with water. So uh-huh. then besides in the cherries up, it's also to uh-huh. pass through this thing called the flotation test. Uh-huh. So is that if your cherry is unripe, it will float uh-huh. to the base of the water tank and then the ones that are right will actually sink all to the bottom. So that way they can easily remove and separate the dried cherries from the dried cherries. So after everything is sorted, thoroughly clean, they will then dry them out on the raised beds on a very thin layer as well. And then uh, everything will also be raked very similarly to the Uraga Tome, they will be raked every single hour. So the cherry, the whole cherries will just be laid out to dry. So this is the essence and the beauty of natural processed coffee. So imagine you have the coffee cherry and then all the flesh contains sugar. And then mm-hmm. you make it and then they actually get to, the sugars get to develop and ferment with all the heat going on. And then the coffee bean in the middle is absorbing all that sweetness and all the flavors from the flesh. Yeah. So that would actually contribute as to why the Tabe Bogan is tasting so sweet and so syrupy. Yeah. Mm. So for Tabe Bergan, uh, the farmers were a little bit more creative in the sense that the first few days, they tried to speed up the drying process by laying there on a single layer. And then mm-hmm. after a few days, they will then increase the thickness mm-hmm. of the berries that is being dried on the raised beds because they want to kind of slow down the drying process. So think about it as you are slow cooking your meat. You know, the mm-hmm. longer you cook it with very low fire, so more flavors will be slowly in, uh, in, in inputted into your coffee. Yeah. So I uh, like, I mean, they also mentioned that to dry like coffee, just the drying process, right? Sometimes on a cloudy day, like maybe today, it will take sometimes like up to three weeks. So 
like coffee, I think it's, I mean, tasty coffee, usually with minimal defect, comes with a lot of QC in each process that they do, right? There's a lot of correlation between that, which is, which is pretty interesting. I think that makes us like enjoy the coffee on our table a lot better. Let's taste it now when it's warm. Yeah, I can't wait. So we have um, one of our friend mentioned that the 2018-2019 Uraga Tome was like the is a pretty good harvest, like pink guava and blood orange, but that was a wash coffee. So this yeah. night, let's try. Yeah. Okay. It's just like I think like on the first impression I get like tropical fruit like mangoes or like strawberry and then also reminds me a little bit like lychee, that, that clean kind of fruit sweet, sweetness as well. And what I like about the Tabe Boka is that um, it has this very nice floral aftertaste, which mm. I seldom get from natural processed coffee. I mean, from all the cards that I have tried so far. Mm. Floral notes and something that is so delicate. Like I'm getting lots of chamomile in the aftertaste from So I think that's uh, the beautiful part. The beautiful part about working with specialty coffee is that you actually get to find out all that thing, all the things that are happening on a farm level, whatever that, whatever all the efforts that goes through to come up with this final cup of coffee that we are able to taste today. Yeah, all that makes me a bit more appreciative of what I'm drinking every day as well. Yeah, they also say that it takes quite a lot of hand from coffee from farm to reach you, like, to the table, right? How many hands does it take? I think about 42, right? 42. From cherry picking to processing, you know, to shipping, to roasting, yeah, probably to packing, and then probably us, barista, <laughs> and then we serve you a cup. Yeah. So it was very fun to be able to, like, go through all three of the coffee, like, today and to talk a little bit about it if you want more details you can always just like just ask us just type your question or comment we will go through them now and we would again just have a conversation to say hello for the those that just joined us and we will also record this virtual cupping so later on if you want to catch up with the video if you want to just cup at home again at another time you can rewatch it at our YouTube channel at PPP Coffee. So yeah, let's answer some question now. I see we are pretty, we, she is going to be pretty busy because there's a lot of questions for her. I'll try my best. Let's go. Ooh, um, so we have one of our good friend called Harif. Harif mentioned that um, it's a little bit off topic, but the Hartman Black Whining is really good. Um, right, it's one of my favorite coffee like last season as well. Then we have another question from Angelina. How do we determine which coffee is better with milk? Or does it boil down to personal preference? Mm, I think it's a little bit of both. Like, mm -hmm. when, we, when we serve, on, I think on the barista level or on the retail mm -hmm. level, we recommend coffee to people. Essentially, we want people to enjoy the coffee that showcases its best traits. Mm -hmm. uh, that coffee is a bit more on a delicate kind of profile. Sometimes mm -hmm. with milk, it might kind of cover the key traits that we are trying to showcase to people. Mm -hmm. that, that maybe the coffee is best to be enjoyed without milk. But mm -hmm. then ultimately, I think it also boils down to taste preference. Like some people, they just really, really like strong coffee. And then by adding milk, it kind of tones it down a little bit. But uh -huh. sometimes it also bring up the best flavors from the cup and if my customer or my consumer enjoys it they are happy then i think i'll be happy as well so i think it's a little bit of both i see this is a very good reply thank you um harif also went cupping at pvp advanza he said it's fun like a blind date which i totally <laughs> agree i think blind blind cupping is fun because you don't know what you're tasting so without judgment you can taste and evaluate better then when it opens up then you realize oh wow actually you know that tasted like that it's pretty cool right yeah 
I think talking about blind cupping, sometimes uh, when we receive new coffee samples, what we do is that uh, we will just blind cup as well. And then sometimes the thing with, cup, with coffee is that we will actually have this image attached to the coffee that, oh, we are from mm. this coffee, uh, you are processed this way, you are probably going to taste this way. So, yeah. you know, some of us will actually like put a bed onto the coffee to see which coffee is it before we open up. And then I think that's the fun. times the coffee that we thought uh, would be the one that we thought would be the one that we like end up turning out to be totally someone different. Yeah, yeah. it's it's quite fun and surprising. Do we use third wave water? Question from Charlie Chua. Do we use third wave water? Mm. I think right now we are not. Right now we are both using uh, our own filtered water. That's so, right. In cafe settings, most of the specialty coffee places, they actually have a own water filtration system uh, to remove excess and to reintroduce the minerals that we want for our coffee. Mm. So mm. Third wave, I think only some places they are using it, but for us, not right now. But we will also be bringing in a product that helps right, like to brew better coffee at home. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? So... Uh, there's this genius in the coffee industry called Maxwell Colonna. So mm-hmm. he, I think somewhere along his coffee journey, he realized that water plays a very, very big role in how mm-hmm. your coffee And then he came out with a book called, uh, he came out with a book. Then after that, he also designed a that helps you to calibrate and to also reintroduce minerals into your cup, into right. your water. So it's called the peak water. Which coming mm-hmm. in soon. So now, stay tuned. I brand don't have like invest in those very big cartridges for your water filter. Yeah, and you can just easily have your own filter water at home in just a jump. Yeah. Um, we have another like feedback from otherwise me. Uh, Hello. So the only challenge with cupping at home is trying to identify certain notes that it's not common maybe in our daily like daily food that we eat, like bergamot or maybe pink ginger. But actually I think pink pink ginger is quite common, right? It's also known as like galangal. It's like a floral or like blue blue ginger sort of like aroma flavor. Oh yeah, Raja. Uh ginger blossom. It's like quite perfumey. Yeah. I think someone wants because my palate last time wasn't as sensitive and uh-huh. I really troubles picking up tasting notes like I'll feel very stressed out because while I'm tasting and then everyone was just like yelling out different tasting notes and then I was still trying my best to taste and then I asked a colleague how uh-huh. to my taste buds and then he thank you Adriel <laughs> he actually said that like I either drink more alcohol <laughs> Or you can just practice mindful eating. Yeah. <laughs> it's the uh, I do agree with the alcohol part, but we are mindful eating. <laughs> <laughs> so like when you when you eat a fruit, for example, try to like remember the taste and associate it with the food that you're eating. And then uh-huh. more practice someday when you're tasting a cup of coffee and then you'll just hear in the face like, oh, that tastes like the green apples that I had that day. Yeah. That's I'm true. I'm still, I'm still trying, I'm still learning. Yeah, like for us as well, I think we get also a little bit excited when we go to like grocery shopping. And then when we find like a fruit that is interesting, we always try to buy and share around with the team. So it's also another way of like our, like how we calibrate each other's palate when we taste something, right? <laughs> So that when we find that notes in the coffee, it's easier to be able to communicate like the message. It's very interesting. So is Kenyan coffee so different because of like soy weather? Sorry? Is Kenyan coffee so different because of soy and weather? What's the main contribution of flavors for Kenyan coffee? I think there is no one single factor. There's many, many different factors all put together. Uh-huh. So I think the soil, the weather, the variety, like what Carmen mentioned, and all the 
the farmers or the producers are processing the coffee as well. Like even the water that they, they are using to process, to wash, and to ferment is all different as well. So I think yeah. it's to isolate a single reason. I think everyone contributes together. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And like, I mean, even like the same coffee, different harvests, it's gonna taste slightly different. Like we've been working with this coffee called Suke Koto. I'm sure you guys would like have definitely tried it. We've been working like for about four to five years already, right? So every harvest more than that. I think we're well, going to seven years. Yeah, it's quite it's quite a long relationship. So with every harvest, we get a little bit excited because we get to know more about the coffee. The more we taste, the more we understand. The more like we are sort of like in love with it, it's pretty cool. So I think that's the thing about um how we because there are some far, some farmers that we work with every year. For example, uh-huh. the one that Kamal mentioned, and then also the Guatemala coffees from Family Bonds. So every uh-huh. year there we will buy some of the coffees we will buy again, and it's same. Same varietal, but just a different crop year, and we get to mm-hmm. see the, how they perform and how they improve and all that. And that actually gives us, with having that kind of relationship with the producers that go with every year, it actually helps us to give them feedback and then mm-hmm. they can also together with us as well. That's true. So it's about, it's a lot about relationship, right? So, very interesting. Um, question and it's by copy exchange how do we calibrate like our palette with each other how do we calibrate uh, production cupping is pretty useful so some things that we do is that uh, we will reaffirm each other so like for example we can be both be tasting on the same cup and then like we will talk to each other and then be like hey do you taste this this did you get this very nice chocolatey aftertaste from this or like yeah. the acidity is higher in this cup than this cup and then we will go back and forth with each other and then we'll try to find a new point that over time we kind of understand each other also understand each other's threshold mm. and how we should calibrate our palates to each other yeah I think like when we are calibrated among the team it's easier to feedback as well and easier to decide on tasting notes which is very useful Cause uh-huh. everyone has a different, everyone has different vocabulary uh-huh. to how we taste something, and everyone has different thresholds. So by saying out what we really feel, we will kind of find out what is this taste that I've been tasting, but I don't know how to identify as well. Yeah, that's that's true. How you can think of that? Crazy, samey thoughts. Sorry, crazy any thoughts. Um, one of the user, very nice name, unique choice of a username, by the way. So, any thoughts on keeping coffee in a metal tumbler? Does it continue to like cook? Does it have weird taste due to the metal interaction? I think because, uh, yeah, I think putting coffees in a thermos will change it slightly. Uh, but certain coffees are a little bit more reactive. So I think the suge kuto, because uh-huh. in, the, in the retail area, we actually have coffee samples that we saw in a thermos. Uh-huh. And uh, for the hot coffees, I think last season when we brewed the guats, they don't really sit well in a thermos. They kind of turn a little bit herby and uh-huh. very, very... And that's where we decide to brew them over ice and store them in a the thermos instead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think guards are our guards tend to be a bit more reactive in a the thermos. Mm-hmm. But certain coffees they actually still taste pretty good. Like the Hartman tasted a little bit like whiskey and a little bit like rummish, kind of sweet, but like very round body, very syrupy. Mm-hmm. So I think it, I think it depends on the kind of coffee that you're putting in. Mm, yeah. Definitely. So, a question by another fun username called Ulala. There's so many coffee farms in Africa. How do we decide which farm to feature for our season two coffee program? Oh, I think a few things 
that they have shared with us previously. One is of course the quality of mm-hmm. the topic. The second mm-hmm. thing is so uh, whether do they practice ethical farming, mm-hmm. like, and also do they uh, take care of the environment? For example, I think they all shared with us before that sometimes the water that is being discharged after processing can actually be a little bit toxic to the environment. So like mm-hmm. a good a good producer will actually treat the water and then mm-hmm. we just on whether like is the farm that you're buying from is it are they ethical, are they doing uh, sustainable sustainable farming and also clean water supplies. So I think these are some of the factors to consider together with the quality of the coffee before we bring them. Okay, future of cupping in public for hygiene reason by Coffee Tao K nine eighty nine. Future. What do you think is the future of cupping that is a bit more like I mean hygiene due to the coronavirus situation? So actually, right now, what we are doing, the way that we are cupping right now, is the old way of cupping mm-hmm. where everyone will just take. Yeah, spoons, rinse in a rinsing cup, and then we just start from it. But then the whole COVID, yeah, that's right. So that is one of the that are cupping right now. Have two spoons that you're just gonna pour and then drink. Part of COVID, um, SCAs, Specialty Coffee Association, they also uh, implemented a new way of cupping as well, which, hang on a second. So the other way right now is that everyone must have a spoon and a cup. So when uh-huh. you're at a cupping session, in order not to have any uh, contact, body fluid contact, what they do is that you're going to rinse your spoon as usual. Then just get a bit, pour it into the cup, and then you drink from the cup. So this prevents all that, all that contact with all the saliva. Yeah. So I think this would probably be the new way of cupping or we can do what we are doing right now, virtual cupping. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think virtual cupping is pretty cool because you get to have the coffee all to yourself. Yeah. Right. Okay, right. since we are talking about slurping, would it be rude when we start to slurp at the cafe next time? I would think that just enjoy the coffee as it is. Uh, slurping is more of helping us to evaluate on the cupping table um, but I think the best way to co- enjoy coffee will just to be just drink nicely for the yeah. cup yeah. so I think the slurping we can just keep it on the cupping table yeah so like when, when, we, when we slurp it's more to sort of exaggerate flavours to evaluate right like objectively but when we are like in a cafe we want to be able to enjoy coffee for like what it is right which is why it's, it's a little bit different but if you do start slurping you can you can just let them know that Shirley has taught you how <laughs> i just totally came so um how do we normally like what do we normally do when one of the harvest is not as good how do how do we normally address with farm farmers mm. I guess it's about the, the communication and just the bu- building relationship and trust, right? Like, because coffee is so organic, every harvest is going to be a little bit different, right? And we are both, like, constantly learning from each other on how, like, to be better. I think that's probably how to run. Uh-huh. And it's very right, very true. So, I think earlier on this year when we visited Myanmar to come mm-hmm. some uh, latest harvest. Uh, certain coffees perform a lot better than last year. Certain coffee did not perform as well. So, I would think that as long as you, as the taster or as the buyer, you can convey mm-hmm. the coffees are tasting very, very objectively to the farmers, I think they are very receptive to it. So, mm-hmm. just be like, oh, you know, when I visit this coffee this year, you know, this one seems to taste a little, a little bit on this side. Yeah, so communication will actually help them to be a little bit more aware in how to improve and the things to take note in their next hours. Nice. That's a very good insight. Which 
place do you think it's more diverse? Like Kenyan or Ethiopia? <laughs> I think Ethiopians. I think Ethiopian coffees are more diverse, like uh, especially the natural coffee. And because, for example, most natural Ethiopians I get is like lychee, very very mango, very ripe mangoes kind of thing. But then this kind of showed me that oh. It actually can taste kind of floral, even when it's a natural process as well. Mm. Yeah. Ethiopians are a little bit more diverse, and now mm. this whole tasting profile thing is like getting even wider. The whole diversity is getting even wider because like mm. everyone is creative with how they want to process the coffees. Like there are people who are doing things like an aerobic, an aerobic fermentation, double fermentation, and all of that is going to add more complexities to their coffee. Yeah, I I totally agree. But the Ethiopians, they have, they definitely have a little bit more diversity to it. Okay, so I think we should also touch a lot, a little bit about like, like coffee farm that are not. I mean, not to say underprivileged, but they are maybe like not so like well to do. So they may not have equipment, knowledge, or they may not even like actually taste coffee the way we taste it. But they are. I mean, they're responsible for like harvesting coffee, just selling them. How do we? How are we able to help them as coffee roaster? Sorry, you're you're talking about how are we going to help them to have better quality of better, coffee? Yeah. Perhaps to spread a bit more awareness with people uh-huh. as to what happens on a farm level. So I think sometimes I get feedback from people that like, "Hey, why your coffee so expensive?" But uh, when you know what it takes to come up with this cup, I think or uh-huh. less you become a bit more of a willing buyer, willing spender, because you know that oh, from the very start, how they take care of their crop, uh, they need to like remove the weeds, they need to put fertilizers, they need to make sure that everything is clean. All of that, and then like harvesting season, where do they hire the people? Hmm. All the steps that it takes, for example, like the hand sorting, hmm. the, the people who are processing and breaking all that coffee for you, all hmm. of that. Then it's like man, you need manpower, and all that is cost. So with all of that, your it will definitely contribute to the cost of the coffee that you drink at the end of the day, and on top of all of that. Your roasters who are roasting the coffee for you it is not just like oh fire and they just roast the coffee, but like there's like screens, there's t- temperature probe, all of that to really go and measure and make sure that everything is on point. And I think for that, for our consumers to appreciate and to make them support the farmers a little bit more, really is to gain let them gain a bit more awareness as to so much, so many things are happening behind the scenes before you mm-hmm. get. To- of coffee yeah and they will be addicted and then they'll start buying more and then when they buy more my farmers will earn more and then they're rattling <laughs> yeah i think like um when we are i mean being in the coffee industry like we know coffee is like a, a beverage right or like a seed but like actually both of us we had the chance to visit a farm so i went to indonesia like bandung and uh shili actually went to myanmar it was definitely very eye opening to be able to see how, like, the coffee plantation and to meet the farmers and to speak and just interact with them and to understand like the process. I think it was very eye opening, right? And I think what really helps them is that if, uh, if they have very loyal, regular buyers from them. For example, if you constantly work with them every year, every year, every year, they will constantly be getting more support. Mm. For- and better communication, trusted communication, and then they can mm-hmm. improve the years. And I think that's also another way on our level to support the producers as well. Yeah, totally agree. Um, hello, El- Ellen V. Thank you for joining us today. So he mentioned that virtual cupping would introduce additional variable, like cup brew time would be a little bit different. 
So he's very interested to see like what would emerge of the future of like coffee cupping, which both of us are very excited as well because cupping coffee it's uh, it's a daily routine for us to like QC the coffee and to understand like the coffee with each batch. It's gonna be a little bit different. So yeah, I'm I'm very excited to see the the future of where this goes. Yeah. Right. So. Um, we also have some one of our good friend, Adriel, also mentioned that the future of Ethiopia is exciting and also challenging. But there's so much to learn. Um, but transparency and consistency still remain challenging. However, like one of the criteria that when we decide to buy coffee is that there has to be transparency and traceability, and also a good story to be told, other than a high cup quality. Which is why we are very happy to present like this cupping session online now, and we are very grateful that we are able to talk about it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, thank you for keeping all the questions um coming in. I think we're gonna do like maybe two more questions, and we're gonna we will actually also shout out a virtual like promo oh, sorry not virtual verbal <laughs> i've been doing a lot of things virtually so now i'm like a little bit mixed up but we actually have a promo code for the viewers that are watching with us today so this promo code is actually only gonna be said verbally so later on after answering two questions you guys will have to pay attention okay so um Alan Lee again thinks that like PV's effort to communicate more about the coffee helps consumer and to justify the price. Thank you very much. Yeah. Commitment to farmers is great because the market is very volatile. It's nice to see you guys continue to work consistently with certain producer. And I think one of our um, favorite like viewer, her name is Ulala. Also like PV coffee because it's simple and tasty. How do we see PP in another five years' time? Yeah. It's a great question. I always like to imagine of the possibility. How would you un- answer that? How do I see us? Mm. Yeah. Continue to bring in more good coffees. We mm-hmm. very many stories. Mm-hmm. I think one of the greatest joy in doing cupping sessions is that able to share the story behind each coffee to people. Mm. And influence and to share with everyone like oh these are what is needed to have a good cup of coffee, and then hopefully we are able to broaden out on more education, more sharing mm. tips to people because I think right now everyone is becoming home brewers. Yes, <laughs> I'm home cupper now as well. See, <laughs> so I think we all hope to bring in more varieties of coffees to share with people in the next five years. Because right now everyone is brewing at home, uh, I think it will be a joy to see everyone becoming very good home brewers and as we share more good coffee with everyone. Definitely. Thank you for sharing. That was was an excellent answer. So again, thank you very much um, everyone that is still here or join us for cupping or even if you're just here to listen and hang out with us. We hope that you enjoy the coffee a lot more now after knowing a little bit more about it. So for those that haven't grab a bag yet, you can do so now on our web store. If you are in Singapore, it's pppcoffee.com and on in KL, it's... Uh, hey, what is it already? Would you like to say? <laughs> it's just like, uh, for Malaysia, it's pppcoffee.com. Dot mine. Right, okay. So, no. share with us how you brew your coffee. We have a promo code that we're gonna just tell you verbally. So, this is your only chance to listen. So, for Discover Africa box set, which is what Shelly have right now, in Singapore, you'll get $3 off or $10 if you're in Malaysia, if you key in promo code coffee on. No space. Coffee on at, at the checkout. You will definitely get that with a discount. So it's only valid until tonight only. So say hello to us to tell your favorite coffee in this season at PP Coffee. Tag us on Instagram. Thank you very much. I'll see you. Thank you, Shirley. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.